I'm here with Carl. Carl, tell me who you are and what you do at Microsoft. My name's Carl Gretinger and I'm with the IT operations. Uh, I'm a program manager and my job is managing a set of servers and applications that support hardware in our business overseas as well as here in Redmond. And we are standing in your garage in front of this massive device here. Tell me, tell me what you've built here. Um, this is a thermonuclear atomic reactor. It really does squish atoms, it really does produce neutrons, it really does uh, impinge on the very fringe of <laughs> matter and space. So, and, yeah. and what was the, the reasoning behind this? Why did you build this? Well, what happened to me was an epiphany that occurred as I walked into a classroom and saw an instructor with a piece of string and a paper cup and a bunch of students all holding similar. and. Uh, the instructor turned to me and said, well, we're teaching physics. And I looked at, the, looked at the kids, and they had the word lane tattooed across their foreheads. Yeah. They were humiliated, and they weren't impressed. And I suddenly put two and two together and saw that while we may be teaching a curriculum, if we're not inspiring, if we're not creating passion, it's a waste of time. Yeah. And uh, so what's missing? That What's the missing component? And and it's more than just studying the curriculum, it's more than just learning about it, it's a chance to actually feel, touch, and taste what it is to be a scientist. Put on the lab coat, put on the dosimeter, stand in front of a real reactor, work with real isotopes, do science. Yeah. So, how do we do that and make it real? And the journey has taken a year, and this is the result. This reactor, even though it's called an atomic reactor, is radically different from the fission-based atomic reactors at Fukushima and the boiling water reactors we use for power. This one is powered by uh, electricity and deuterium gas, and the moment we turn the switch off, radiation stops. Yeah. So the typical reactor is breaking apart atoms to get power. This is putting them together to also get power. Correct. And how much power can you get from this? Uh, this one would be down in the uh, microwatts, uh, an infinitesimally small amount, because we're actually dealing with 400,000, 500,000 individual atomic events per second. Yeah. And at that level of, of activity, it's not going to be something that any of our instruments could even measure, other than we can do some counting and project some, some theoretical numbers. It's designed to bring the whole atomic experience into an ordinary public school classroom where it can be safely uh, shared with the students. So tell me about some of the components here. What is the cage, the bell jar, and the shielding around it? Um, well, the, the reactor shield itself is made out of a combination of lead, uh, a mixture of boron and paraffin, 70-30, about three and a half inches thick, another eighth inch uh, of cadmium, pure 99.999% um, atomic grade, and then we have um, this tread plate on both the, the front and, and the back of the shield. Uh, the bell jar and the vacuum pump, this whole bottom part of the machine actually came from Cape Canaveral, and I ordered it off of eBay. <laughs> they brought it right to my driveway. Nice. And so from that machine, we tore it completely down, did all the sanding and painting and uh, refitting all the rubber uh, washers and put it back together again. So today, um, it's pretty much in the configuration it was, only we've added those elements that are unique to the fusion process. And so, uh, tell me about the, the cage that we're looking at here, this wire cage. What actually is going on there? The ball of plasma that we see in there is nothing more than a collection of, of nuclei with the electrons stripped away that has reached an energy temperature of about two to three hundred million degrees Fahrenheit. And it's suspended in this, in this uh, electrostatically charged field. Um, the fusion events aren't going to be something that you can see optically, or if you do, uh, we're not dealing with a machine that's, uh, that I know anything about. Yeah. But the, the, the events are individual nuclei colliding within that plasma, and when they do, um, they release a neutron, and that we can detect. And yeah. that's, that's what, what our, our detector, we have a couple of different kinds of detectors, uh, are watching for. We get, we get the neutron, and we also get something called a secondary gamma event mm -hmm. that we can also measure. 
So when you get that uh, ball of plasma in there, what are the types of things that you're testing for or trying uh, once you have that state? The plasma is really the key to the, to the whole story of fusion. Uh, plasma density, um, finding a way to create greater and greater plasma density, higher plasma temperatures, um, creating a deeper pinch because the closer we bring these uh, ions together and the more that we heat them up, the more uh, we're going to see the fusion events and the fusion yeah. events are where we get the energy back. But in the case of a reactor we, like this, it's not, only, it's not only the power we're looking for, the neutrons themselves become invaluable in a process called activation because we can take that neutron stream and we can make very valuable medical isotopes out of it. So it's not just a story of, of powering uh, electrical grids. We could, we could do a, a number of different research projects and we can make isotopes that are used for cardiac and, and uh, a number of different medical procedures um, that are very expensive to create today using a full-size reactor. So you mentioned this is a device for teaching. Uh, we have some, some young people here today. Tell me about these, these students and uh, what, what they're actually learning here. Um, so, this is my team. And we have Haley O'Neill, Chase Price, Eric Snyder, Jace Glenn, Crystal Shu, and... Uh, they look a little young for nuclear scientists. They are, but don't let those looks <laughs> deceive you because they know exactly what this machine is doing. They are the ones, in fact, who built it. Yeah. And they worked hard all summer long, grinding, scraping, bending, painting, and putting it together. And they understand through the prototyping process and now into the operational phase exactly what it means to put something together and, and to learn how um, to find that sweet spot in running it. And but so when you get this running and it, it's actually fired up, how much of it do you have to do compared to how much the students are doing? Right now, I'm an advisor. I am not in any way directly in charge of the operations of the machine anymore. They're quite capable of taking that machine, firing it up, and driving it through its entire um, operational phase. I serve to answer theoretical questions and uh, possibly suggest variations in the, in the schema so that we can look at aspects that we haven't seen before, which is the whole wonder of exploring nuclear fusion. And what do you hope to gain from this in the long term? The number one thing I hope to gain from it is that these young people would be empowered with the passion for science and technology that our nation so badly needs. We, we have failed to to inspire our young people in school. One out of every three kids is currently dropping out of school. 1.25 million kids are going to drop out in, in high school. Uh, and, and so with one third of the kids dropping out of high school, who's going to pay their cost of living because they can't earn a livable, living, a livable wage? And so we want to back up. We want to find out what went wrong. Most importantly, we want to model a class that has the right stuff that creates the right experience where people are walking away excited, enthusiastic, and glad they're part of it. And I can tell you this team is proud to be part of this operation. All right, can we see this thing get fired up? Yes. Excellent, let's do it. All right, Chase? Turn on shield control. Shield control's on. Raise radiation shield. Cold tap is loaded, it's down too. Crystal, you give me a temperature check on the uh, uh, diffusion pipe.
what we're waiting on right now is for the diffusion pump to heat up to a certain point where it'll um, where it'll heat up the oil, so it'll drop the drop the, uh, um, the pressure down to a, a much more usable level for our fusion, and down to that level we can start putting in our deuterium, which will be our fuel for our nuclear fusion. On. Turn high voltage to 15 milliamps. Raising high voltage. Slowly, please. Oh, we get, okay, we got neutrons right away. Mm -hmm. so we got to what you're listening to is not Orville Redenbacher. <laughs> That's thermal nuclear fusion. Well, let's not go any further than that. Awesome. Yeah. That's five million. I understand. It's, you, you, it's really, really hot tonight. We've got, a, we've got a star. I can see the beams. Do we have any leakage? No. Nothing. Okay. We don't need to have any Give me about uh, two more millions. One more. The glass is still at 72. No leakage? We are getting some fluorescing of the glass, but we are rising in temperature on the vessel. Still so down to a Can you bring me up to 10? CCM of deuterium, please. Okay. And can you kill those lights? you the fires live. We'll be looking at them through this one inch polycarbonate. Crystal P. Lee, can I have side scans please? Don't go under the lid. beauty. You're seeing a nice plasma jet coming out the top of a single instance of plasma that's trapped inside the center electrode. 